on the next in the series of webinars from the Sheffield Employment Team, HR Matters, dealing with the absences arising from COVID-19. Before I hand you over, if you've got any questions for any of the panellists, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. If you've got any technical issues throughout, please use the chat function and I can answer these. I'll hand over to Tom. Thanks very much. Great. Thank you, Tom. Um, so welcome, everybody, uh, to the November HR Matters webinar from the Sheffield Employment Team. Um, before we start get, getting cracking on today's topic, which is dealing with absences arising from COVID-19, a couple of bits of news about the Sheffield uh, employment team at Freet. Um, firstly, I'm delighted to say that we are joined this morning by not only managing associates Elizabeth Ferguson and Toby Pochran, but also Lee Williams, who is newly qualified solicitor, giving us a wave there. He's, uh, he, he's joined as a qualified solicitor in our team. Uh, and completes the five of us together with legal assistant Sir Her Hamer. So Lee's going to be doing his first speaking slot on one of these webinars, so please be gentle with him. The second piece of good news from the Sheffield employment team is that we have been recognised by the Legal 500 in the Yorkshire region for the very first time. So the, the Sheffield Freeths office has been going for about nine years uh, and we are very pleased to say uh, that the Legal 500 have recognised us uh, for the first time for our <coughs> skills and experience in employment law. Um, for those of you who don't know, the Legal 500 is uh, an independent uh, organisation who uh, ranks and uh, recognises uh, employment lawyers and lawyers from all disciplines in fact. So uh, we are delighted by that and you may have seen some of that news on LinkedIn. So turning to today's session, um, it feels difficult to do sessions like this without adding the words in a global pandemic to all topics. Uh, and we have decided to do that for this session as well, because the current situation is obviously affecting everybody, all businesses uh, to a huge extent. So instead of the normal managing absence sessions that you may well have seen us do in the past, we've now added arising from COVID-19 after it. So we're looking at some of the issues that our clients have been dealing with um, in terms of absence management uh, in the new uh, coronavirus world. So let's have a look at the overview this morning. Um, we're going to start by uh, having an update um, from Lee on the coronavirus job support scheme and the changes that are happening over the next couple of weeks in relation to that. And then we're going to move on to look at uh, sickness absence due to COVID-19 in particular, um, and also looking at the changes to statutory uh, sick pay um, and then uh, looking at the general issues that are created by absence management both in terms of long-term and short-term absence management and then having a look at some specific issues that are created not directly as a result of COVID-19 but as a result of some of the issues that are created for people needing to quarantine, self-isolate uh, and uh, issues around lockdown absence before leaving some question and answer time at the end. So we're aiming for a, an 11.30 finish. We have kept uh, some, quest some time for questions at the end. So as Tom said, if you do have any questions, please do put those in the Q&A box uh, as we're going through and we will um, come to answer those at the end. We did have a couple of very specific questions from people uh, before the webinar, which we're very grateful for, but we aren't going to look at those as part of the Q&A session. We're going to deal with those separately because they were very specific around very um, individual issues that are facing those uh, particular organisations. Um, but we will pick up those with you offline uh, for the people who ask those questions. So uh, I'm now going to uh, hand over to Lee to have a look at Coronavirus Job Support Scheme. Over to you, Lee. Thank you for your kind introduction, Tom. So 
Hi everyone. Um, so as Tom says, I'm just going to briefly go through the coronavirus job support scheme. I'm not going to go through this in too much detail uh, for two reasons really. First, we don't actually have much detail from the government on it yet. Um, and secondly, I'm sure you've all come to listen to uh, Toby, Tom and Elizabeth talk about absence. Um, so I'll try and get through this as quick as I can. Um, so the coronavirus job support scheme, it's um, coming to replace the coronavirus job retention scheme, which we all know is due to uh, finish on the 31st of October. Um, the job support scheme will start on the 1st of November and it's um, initially planned to be in place for six months. Um, so it'll run through until April 2021. It's open to all businesses, although this time large businesses will have to pass a financial assessment test. Uh, we don't know what's going to be classed as a large business or what this financial uh, financial assessment test is yet and um, we're awaiting more guidance on that uh, but for small and medium enterprises um, all will be able to access this scheme um, there's no need for an employee to have been furloughed on the previous scheme to be eligible under the uh, job support scheme but they do need to have been on the payroll on or before the 23rd of september so that's the cutoff date for this scheme the 23rd of sept uh, september um, but if an employee has previously been furloughed, this will not affect their um, entitlement to um, the, um, the bonus from the job retention scheme. So the thousand, up to a thousand pound bonus, what employees can get for employees who have previously been furloughed will not be affected. Um, so how much can an employee get under this scheme? Um, so to qualify, um, an employee must work at least a third of the usual hours. They can work more than a third, but they can't work any less. Um, so if an employee works a third of their hours, for example, um, the two thirds of hours what won't be worked, will, the cost of those will be split evenly between the government, the employer and the employee. So the, uh, the, the employer must pay the employee in full for the first third of the hours what are worked and then the two thirds of the hours what aren't worked will be shared equally. Um, if we go on to the next slide, I believe there's a nice pie chart which shows how these numbers will operate in practice. So if we look at the first example, this is for an employee who will be working a third of their hours, um, which is in yellow on the pie chart. Those hours will be worked and will be paid by the employer. And so we, we, lo we lost the slide. <laughs> I'll carry on. Um, so um, I think most people have got the slides anyway. So the first third of the hours um, will be worked and paid for by the employer. Of the remaining two thirds, that will be split evenly between the employee, the employer, and the government. Um, there's another example on the screen for an employee who works. Um, it's not on the screen now, but it was on the screen. There's another, there was another example for an employee who works half of their hours, and it shows a breakdown of who will pay uh, cover those remaining hours. Um, the government contribution is limited, so although they'll pay up to a third of the hours not worked, that is still capped. So the government cap is at £697.92 um, for the um, third of what they will be paying for the unworked hours. So clearly under the new scheme, uh, the contributions from the government are a lot less generous than under the coronavirus job retention scheme, um, where you could get up to 80% to start with. Um, part of this is because the government has been keen to stress that this new scheme is to protect viable jobs only. So the sort of tune of the government's change to protecting jobs which a viable post sort of pandemic. Um, so, I mean, the government have released a fact sheet on this scheme. And the first line of the fact sheet is, job support scheme is designed to protect viable jobs in businesses who are facing lower demand in the winter months. Uh, so this scheme is not designed to sort of prolong jobs, which inevitably aren't gonna be there um, in a few months time. And for that reason, a, a employer cannot claim support under the scheme if an employee is under notice of redundancy so unlike under the old scheme or the current scheme where you could claim notice pay you can't do this under the new scheme um, so yeah a lot less generous than the coronavirus job retention scheme not on the slides but which you may be aware of uh, there is an expansion to the job support scheme for businesses who have been forced to close because of the government restrictions uh, we don't have much detail on this yet um, but it's probably going to sort of apply to businesses what have been forced to close if they're in one of the higher tiers um, or un unable to open the doors. Under this scheme, employers can get two thirds of employee salaries, of the usual salary, up to a cap of £2,100 a month. So this is where an employee doesn't work any of their hours uh, because the business has been forced to close. 
and um, the government will contribute up to two, thir two thirds of salary capped at £2,100. Of the remaining third, the employer does not have to pay those salaries, so effectively the employee will sadly lose that amount. Um, the only expense for the employer will be pension contributions and employer national insurance contributions. Um, and then, yeah, the government will cover the two thirds. Um, so, so that's pretty much all we have at the minute on, on um, the job support scheme. We are anticipating new guidance from the government um, in due course. Um, currently, we just have these fact sheets, um, which are available online. So if you do want to sort of go back and have a look at what I've spoke about today, um, it's all there on the government website. Um, if you do have any specific questions, just feel free to pop them in the chat. Um, and yeah, so that's pretty much it from me. I'm going to now hand over to Elizabeth, who's going to talk about um, COVID-related sickness absence and statutory sick pay. Thank you. Thanks, Lee. That's really um, a helpful run through of that. And you know, as Lee said, obviously, we're still slightly in the dark in terms of some of the specifics of the scheme, but hopefully they'll come to light over the next week or two and we'll be in touch with everyone when they do. Um, so I am also obviously going to use the COVID word quite a lot um, in the next five, 10 minutes in my little section of the talk. The general topic of the talk is, is sickness absence. Um, and Tom's going to talk you through some of the general issues which arise from employee sickness absence. And obviously the standard approach taken to supporting employees who are absent from work on sickness grounds, but also how to address sickness absence when it becomes an operational issue for your organisation. But you know, that aside, there's very little that's standard at the moment in terms of how employers deal with things. And coronavirus has obviously introduced an additional layer of complication to dealing with um, employee sickness, some of which the government has sought to address through legal changes to sickness absence support and pay, which I'll touch on in the next slide. But when talking about COVID and sickness, um, the starting point is the same as it has always been in that an employer, you know, as an employer, you have a statutory duty of care towards your employees. Um, this means doing what you reasonably can to support your employees' health, safety and well-being when they're working from you. And importantly, you know, remembering that's both within the workplace, but also if they're working elsewhere, you know, increasingly commonly at home now. So if they're off site. Um, Toby in his section is going to go discuss some of the health and safety issues arising from coronavirus in a bit. But I just want to highlight that during the current crisis, when we talk about this sort of general duty of care towards employees um, and towards their welfare, it's particularly relevant that this um, includes mental health support that you might want to put in place for your employees. That's more pertinent now than it perhaps has ever been, um, especially given the impact which um, the current health crisis is having in relation to people having to work from home, um, in some cases exclusively, or the requirement to um, self-isolate and the impact that that might be having on their mental health. So um, just some practical examples of some of the um, organisations that we work with and what people have put in place. Um, some large organisations particularly, um, particular already had um, long-standing counselling provisions for their employees. Usually it's through a scheme known as an employee assistance programme, but it is something that some employers have looked to introduce in the last six months. Um, given you know the heightened awareness around mental health and um, coronavirus. Um, other workplaces have adopted a, a mental health champion um, as part of their sort of overall duty of care in this respect. So that's just someone who within the workplace leads on perhaps changing attitudes to mental health or um, just pointing employees in the right direction if they let you know that they need a little bit more support in that respect um, and they have you know, various guidance and um, numbers that they can pass on to the employees who do get in touch. Um, other organisations have introduced systems to offer support in other ways, such as you know, a mental health support group or mental health network, um, joining up with other businesses or organisations. Um, and then just on the, you know, the everyday practical point, it's, it's just important to have in place checks for your workers, again, particularly if they're off-site most of the time. Um, you know, for instance, greater management contact, perhaps setting up regular meetings. Um, a lot of our clients set up virtual work groups um, you know, via Zoom or whatever it might be, again, on a regular basis, so people know that they're going to have that contact. Um, they provide guidance in terms of working from home, um, particularly the issue in relation to keeping a dividing line between work and home life, which can be very blurred at the moment for a lot of us. Um, and you know, it's just very difficult to, to retain um, in the current circumstances. 
and just having a clear communication system set up for those employees who are no longer physically working next to each other, which I think a lot of us really miss so that they feel part of that wider team. So there's a lot of different sort of levels of support that employers are putting in, but it all feeds in to this duty of care towards employees, which is always there, but as I said, is very much heightened in the current times. Um, and then just in relation to the support required for workers in light of COVID-19, it's obviously important to be particularly um, conscious of any additional support required for your disabled workers. Um, in particular, if they are self-isolating. So again, the usual duty of care applies in terms of you know, the welfare support that um, employers should be offering. But there is, of course, you know, additional legal protection and positive duties in place for disabled workers, which do need to be carefully considered. Um, and there can be legal implications that arise if you're not doing that. So if one of your employees self-isolates because of their disability and you as their employer treat them unfavorably because of this by not paying them or dismissing them and taking disciplinary action against them ultimately potentially dismissing them for an authorized absence then you could have a potential claim on your hands for disability discrimination a particular claim for treating the employee less favorably for something arising from their disability what we call a section 15 claim that's because your actions in those kind of cases could arguably be because of something arising in consequence of the employee's disability, i.e. their decision to self-isolate given um, COVID-19. In these types of cases, the employee doesn't need to have a comparator um, to be able to make a claim. They don't need to be able to point to someone else in the office and say, I was treated less favorably than them. Um, so it's not a defense for you to argue that you would treat all employees who decide to self-isolate without medical construction in the same way and that's not going to be enough to sort of stop the, the claim in its tracks as long as they can show that they've been treated less favorably because of something arising from their disability i.e their decision to perhaps um, stay at home and not come into work then that can get the, the claim off the ground there is a possible defense um, or two possible defenses Firstly, if you can show that you didn't know that the employee was disabled and it wasn't reasonable for you to know that they were disabled, obviously that's going to be very hard to make out unless um, you know, the employee has hidden that fact from you. But as soon as they make you aware, then you're under this duty in terms of not treating them less favourably because of something arising from it. Um, secondly, if you can show that the, your treatment of the employee, so for instance, um, in relation to the, um, stopping their pay or um, requiring them to come into the workplace, was a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim. For example, maintaining staffing levels in your workplace to meet customer demand, that can be enough um, to justify your position in that respect. But to honest, it's going to be quite hard to make out that argument other than in the more extreme cases. Um, if you've got someone with a documented disability that you're aware of who feels particularly vulnerable and is reluctant to come into work, you're going to have to show that you've put steps in place to try and support that employee, either working from home or creating a safe working environment before I think you'd be able to justify taking disciplinary action in that, in that kind of example. Um, the other issue to flag up in relation to um, disabled colleagues and in particular, again, um, in the current context is the duty to make reasonable adjustments for them. So um, an employer may be liable for failure to make reasonable adjustments, which I'm sure you're all aware of, you know, that's obviously a, a long standing duty. If you don't facilitate, um, and particularly in the current case, this could arise if you don't facilitate a disabled employee's request to work from home in a pandemic, if reasonable to do so, that is you know, quite likely for, an, um, for many disabilities to be seen as a reasonable adjustment if it's something that can be practically facilitated. There are of course some roles where working from home is not possible or appropriate, you know, it just doesn't work. Um, and in these cases it's not automatically going to be a failure to make reasonable adjustment for you to require the employee to come into work or you know, stop their pay, you know, not continue to pay them because they're not attending work. But again, you're going to have to show what steps you took in terms of putting in place those reasonable adjustments in the first place. And it is likely that you might need occupational health advice on, on a number of questions. You know, firstly, can working from home be facilitated in the first place, even if it's not something your organisation has done in the past? Um, you might want them to confirm or clarify the potential risk to the employee of actually coming into the workplace in terms of is it actually a risk that is posed to the employee? 
And if so, what adjustments can you take to reduce those risks in the workplace, particularly for that employee? So perhaps going further than you have for any of your non-disabled employees who are also attending work. So as I said, you know, a kind of a snapshot decision to just automatically moving to disciplinary action is, an, is quite likely to be a breach of your duty to make reasonable adjustments in that regard. Um, employees should also take note of the social distancing guidance, um, which advises that employees who are clinically vulnerable should keep their overall social distance, sorry, their social interactions low. Um, although the working safely guidance envisages that some clinically vulnerable people may be required to attend work, so you know it's not an absolute blanket ban on them attending work if they cannot work from home um, and social distancing is then implemented, it would be sensible to have in place some form of risk assessment that you've carried out to again show what steps you've taken to actually facilitate that. So you've kind of got your base level of duty of care in relation to all employees, which always exists, but you're going to have to take those additional steps in relation to disabled colleagues, especially if they're flagging up their concerns to you. Um, and then if Tom can just <coughs> move on to the next slide. This is the um, exciting topic of SSP, which we have touched on in the past, but we, we've had quite a few queries about it um, in the last two to three months. So I just wanted to do a quick recap on COVID sick payments as part of the overall talk. Most of these provisions have been in place for a while, but I think some employers um, are a little bit confused about them or perhaps aren't sure in terms of them being ongoing. So we just thought it would be useful to spend a, a couple of minutes just walking you through them again. So um, as part of the government's package of measures to support businesses, obviously new legislation relating to COVID-19 means that statutory sick pay is available from day one instead of the usual day four, which it was in the past, for those affected by coronavirus when self-isolating. This has retrospective effect from the 13th of March when it came in and it is continuing and you know there's no suggestion that that is going to stop um, in the short term. Obviously you know we're still very much in a second wave, maybe there'll be a third wave, we don't know. Um, but while people continue to be affected by COVID-19, we'd expect that these additional um, SSP support provisions will remain in place. It's also now the case, and again has been for a little while, that employers with fewer than 250 employees can reclaim SSP paid in respect to the first 14 days of COVID um, related sickness absence. And again, that has retrospective effect from the 14th of March. So if you fall into that category and you've not already claimed that or you're not claiming that going forward, do make sure that you're putting that in because you know, it can amount to significant sums depending on the number of employees involved. Important to remember though, that any enhanced sickness payments that you as the employer have agreed to pay, um, you know, just part of your overall sickness policy or perhaps you've chosen to enhance it during the current climate, are not affected by the new legislation. So they'll continue to be governed by the terms of your um, employment contracts and they can't be reclaimed. So anything over and above SSP just remains um, ruled by the current contractual provisions. The definition of deemed incapacity for SSP purposes um, also changed um, given COVID and the SSP regulations were extended to include employees who are shielding and therefore unable to work. Um, obviously shielding came to an end in the summer, so this is not currently relevant in England or Wales um, while shielding is paused, but if it is reintroduced as part of this second wave, then I would expect that to be covered um, for SSP purposes again, but obviously we'll have to wait for government clarification on that. But certainly anyone who was shielding up to the end of the shielding date, which I think was in August, um, would have been able to claim SSP for that. Um, and also anyone who is self-isolating for one of a number of COVID related reasons and therefore unable to work. So either they're experiencing symptoms of COVID, um, in which case they have to self-isolate for 10 days, or if early until the end of the isolation period, if they're living with someone or in an extended or linked household with someone who is isolating due to have who is um, isolating due to having symptoms of COVID, in which case that individual then needs to isolate for 14 days, you know, the, the person who lives with them. Um, if you have developed symptoms of COVID while already self-isolating, um, then you have to self-isolate for a further period of 10 days. Um, so these will all be covered SSP purposes. Also, if you've now been advised through the contact tracing system that you've come into contact with someone who was affected with COVID-19, and again, you're required to self-isolate on that basis, and you're notified of the specific period 
within the um, notification that you receive from, from the um, organization, the test and trace organization. If you've actually tested positive for COVID um, and you're self-isolating, then you have to do that for um, the late of 10 days and the date you first have symptoms or the date that you no longer have symptoms of COVID-19. And again, that's covered by SSP now under the new rules. Or if you've been advised to self-isolate at home for a period of 14 days before an admission date to hospital, that only came in at the end of August, the 26th of August. So people will now um, and, and should be able to evidence that they've had that guidance um, due to an upcoming hospital appointment or surgery or whatever it might be and required to have that self-isolation period before going in. So you can ask them to, to evidence that because they should be able to, but if they can, then they're entitled again to SSP. Usually, um, HMRC just states that employers entitled to ask for reasonable evidence of incapacity after the first seven days of sickness absence, and that's you know, the, the standard approach. Um, that's normally a fit note from the employee's GP, um, but it can take other forms if reasonable in the circumstances. Um, again, the rules have been slightly tweaked on that. I mean, I don't know if any of you have tried to call up your GP to ask for anything in the last few months, but A, it's almost impossible to get through. And B, when you do, you normally get some kind of automated message saying, please don't contact us for a fit note because we're not going to provide it. So there's now, the, and there has been for a little while, this um, online system where employees can access um, an online isolation note if they're required to self-isolate. And again, as an employee, you should be accepting that as evidence in terms of qualifying for SSP. And that's another change that has, has come in in light of the current crisis. So there've been a few tweaks, both to make it easier for employees to evidence their sickness and then easier for them to access SSP once that has been evidenced. Um, and it's just making sure that you're aware of those rules so that you're you know, providing the correct payments if, if relevant. Um, and that is all I was going to say about SSP. I said it was very much a recap because we have talked, I think we talked about it back in March and April when it first came in. Um, but obviously, if anyone has any specific questions on that, do just let us know. Now I'm going to hand over to Tom, who's going to talk about the slightly more interesting general background sickness absence. Great. Thank you, Lil. That's really good. Um, yeah, so uh, this is non-COVID related stuff, so you can breathe a sigh of relief uh, if you were uh, sick of um, COVID uh, issues. Um, and so I thought it would be useful just to recap in terms of the general strategies for dealing with uh, sickness absence. <clears throat> before we go on to have a look at managing long-term sickness absence and then managing short-term sickness absence. So the first thing to mention is to have a clear policy and procedure in place. Often employers decide to have a procedure for man managing long-term absence and a different procedure for managing short-term absence, and that's probably a good idea. Um, but overall, the really important thing is that these procedures are applied consistently and fairly. Um, and dovetailing with that is, is monitoring sickness absence because it can be very easy uh, to allow cases to slip through the net if people have had a significant amount of absence. So a lot of employers will put in place triggers in terms of absence management that then moves employees onto a formal process. And it's about managing and monitoring absence to ensure that employees, when they reach those trigger levels, are then being um, actively managed in terms of their, their absence. Um, presenteeism and leaveism. Um, so presenteeism is the idea of, of coming to work even though you're still not 100% well. Um, and leaveism is, is the idea of, of being off at the drop of a hat because you're poorly. And I think um, society is, is, is changing its attitudes over the last kind of six or so months in terms of how we view sickness absence, I think. And there's been a heightened understanding for obvious reasons about the way that infection spreads. And so I think that um, when we come out of the pandemic, I think that this might well be one of the things that stays with employers in terms of more of an understanding of 
the management of sickness, absence, and more understanding towards employees who are sick and not necessarily wanting to have those sick employees in the business potentially spreading uh, disease. So I think it's all about striking the right balance and that balance is going to be different for different organizations depending on the size of the organization, depending on the industry. And it's about employers developing the culture that's right for their organization. You don't want people in the business who are poorly, but at the same time, you don't want people who are taking time off sick too often uh, with minor ailments. So it's about developing that balance properly. And the, um, the, the way that you implement uh, policies and procedures around sickness absence creates that kind of culture um, so I'm going to do the Chris Whitty thing and say next slide please great so we'll, thank you Tom so we're moving on to uh, the process for managing long-term sickness absence um, I, and, and I think the key here is managing long-term absence quickly and promptly and uh, proactively. A lot of the time we will get calls from clients who will say so-and-so has been off for six months and they haven't been actively managed during that period of time. They haven't had an occupational health report, they haven't had welfare meetings, they haven't had any kind of active management of their absence and that really puts us on the back foot because that's essentially wasted time in terms of getting a resolution to this, hopefully getting the employee back in work, or if that's not possible, moving towards a formal process that may well end up in uh, the termination of that employee's employment. But you, my, um, the most important thing from my point of view is to encourage you to, to bite the bullet at an early stage and address these things before um, you, you have all that wasted time and part of the way that you can do that as an employer is by using welfare meetings so use these early they can't be compulsory because they're not part of a formal process but employees who are off sick often welcome them a lot of the time where an employee is absent for a long period of time the employer is in, in a kind of no-win situation and I've heard employees saying oh they just abandoned me they never contacted me they just left me and uh, they weren't in touch and it's all awful but equally I've heard employees complaining oh my employer was on the phone to me all the time asking me when I when I wanted to come back and there's a real again another balance to be struck here between making sure that the you're engaging with your absent employee without making them feel browbeaten into returning to work when they're not well enough to do so. And the idea of a welfare meeting can be a really good way around that problem and it can help you find that right balance. So a welfare meeting you would um, set up with an employee, give them enough time and warning to prepare themselves for that meeting, and then you investigate the reasons for their absence when the employee feels they might be able to return to work you would discuss what you can do as an employer to facilitate them coming back to work and you can use that meeting to try and find out whether there are any work related issues that are preventing them coming back to work as well and looking at their um, medical diagnosis and prognosis so there's loads of things to discuss there. And often these welfare meetings can, can turn up really unusual and unpredictable things that the employee says to you about the way that they're working with their colleagues, maybe their managers, overbearing in their management style. And, and all of these things can be discussed and you can get to the root of the issue. And the issue isn't always the one that's written on the fit note. And so the, the welfare meetings can be a really useful tool for helping to, to manage this kind of situation. I've put PHI there on, on the slide, and this is a really key, key thing. Not in, all employers will have a permanent health insurance policy. In fact, most employers won't. But if an employer does have that kind of policy, 
then it's really important to know that at an early stage. And for those of you who don't know what PHI is, if an employee has ill health that lasts for a certain period of time, normally six months or more, depends on the terms of the particular PHI policy, but if they meet certain medical criteria and have been off for long enough, then the PHI policy will kick in and pay a percentage of their salary until they're well enough to, to return to work. So normally that's maybe three quarters or two thirds of their salary. And for people with chronic long term conditions, if you as the employer terminate their employment without giving them the option of moving on to the PHI policy, that can be a breach of contract. And that can be a very significant breach of contract, because if the, the condition is chronic and the employee isn't going to be able to work for the next 20 years until they retire, you can just imagine how much money that employee has been deprived of during that period of time and therefore how significant that kind of breach of contract claim could be. So it's worth working out whether your employer has that kind of policy and even when whether the employee has got that kind of policy, it is possible to take them out privately. So it's worth talking to employees and exploring uh, those kind of situations because obviously there's a huge potential pitfall there in terms of preventing an employee having access to that insurance that could be very lucrative in the long run. So um, we've got to look at length of service and length of service is important uh, for three reasons. Firstly, it ties into how much company or organisation sick pay uh, an employee is entitled to. Sometimes you can have a kind of a ladder approach where an employee needs to have been employed for a certain period of time to get full pay and then they move down to half pay and then down to SSP and length of service is important in terms of determining um, when uh, the employee moves on to full pay and then off full pay again. But secondly, uh, length of service is also important for um, the reasonableness of, of, of any future dismissal. The longer an employee has been employed, the more an employer has a duty to try everything that they can to facilitate that employee returning to work. Um, an employee who has worked for you for 20 years, you're going to have a higher obligation to that employee than an employee who has worked for you for two months. And then the final point about length of service is if an employee has less than two years service, then they can't bring an unfair dismissal claim. And therefore you have more flexibility in terms of the way that you can deal with their long-term ill health absence. But do bear in mind the issues that Lil was talking about in terms of disability discrimination, because if the long-term absence is caused by a disability and you then go on to dismiss them, then that could be a section 15 disability arising from claim. Um, and you would have to think carefully about whether or not dismissal could be justified as a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim in those circumstances. So if it's less than two years service with the, the, the particular employee, it isn't necessarily mean that you, you can dispense with a procedure entirely. So looking at, at, at ways of managing long-term absence, you'll have to think about the impact on the business. So often the size and administrative resources will determine what kind of decision you take in respect of a, a long-term ill health absence situation. If obviously the impact on the business is high and they're an employee working in a small team, for example, and their absence is creating additional work for their colleagues or meaning that your business isn't able to meet uh, customer demand in the same way, then that will, will impact on the fairness of any future dismissal. And it will also impact on the practical way that you deal with that employee. And the tribunals understand that. And that they, they will give allowances for small employers in these kind of situations who, are, who have a larger impact on the way that they um, 
they work their business as a result of having uh, a long-term absent employee. Whereas if you've got a large organization um, where the employee's absence isn't going to have as much of a direct impact, then there, there, there is going to be an expectation for the tribunals that you're going to give that employee a little bit more leeway and a little bit more time uh, to get themselves better so that they are in, in a position to hopefully return to work. We've then got um, occupational health to look at, and this is really key, I think, because none of us are doctors. We don't know how a condition affects an employee. And so we've got to arm ourselves with the right tools to make the right decisions about absence. And part of that process is getting advice from medical experts. Occupational health can be a really good way of doing this. Um, occupational health, as opposed to the employee's GP, will often provide a more nuanced and independent assessment of the employee's condition when they can return to work, whether that condition might amount to a disability and, and how the condition should best be managed by us as employers to facilitate that employee returning to work. And so I would encourage you guys to get occupational health re reports quickly and then act on them quickly. Um, often occupational health reports can be as good as what you put into them. So the more questions you ask, the more direct questions you ask of, a, of an occupational health expert, the better answers you're going to get and the more detailed answers you're going to get. So spend a bit of time and, you know, we often advise on this, but it's better to put in some time at the start to asking the right questions um, of an occupational health expert. Uh, than rushing the process and getting back a report that's a bit disappointing in terms of providing us with the tools we need to manage this employee's absence. My view is it's often better to go for an occupational health expert rather than a GP. Often GPs will just tell, notwithstanding the, 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 the availability of GPs, as Lil was mentioning earlier at the moment, um, often they will um, just regurgitate what the employee is telling them and so it often isn't very helpful in terms of getting to the nub of the issue so I would encourage you yes there is a cost associated with it but it's worth I think paying to get an independent occupational health assessment done so that um, you can facilitate the employee returning to work with, with the benefit of, of that independent assessment they are a double-edged sword though um, and you can't always predict what an occupational health report is going to say. Sometimes they will come back and they will say the employee is uh, very sick and they're going to be sick and unable to return to work for the foreseeable future. Sometimes they will say you've got to make a, or you, they suggest that you make a long list of, of potential reasonable adjustments uh, and the employee is disabled. And that can um, have an impact on how much uh, you, you have, have to accommodate this employee's disability. So just be aware of um, the, uh, the possibility of getting a report like that back from an occupational health uh, assessment. Um, obviously, you don't have to um, do everything it says in the occupational health report it's down to you as the employer to decide whether the suggested adjustments are reasonable in the circumstances and obviously at this point it's helpful to take legal advice um, but um, it, it is a useful a very useful tool and a tribunal would expect you to have an up-to-date occupational health assessment in place before taking the decision to a dismiss an employee if that's what the process leads you on to doing. Um, we've talked about, well, we'll just talk a little bit about alternative roles now. Um, these have got to be approached sensitively. A role that you as the employer think is a good alternative isn't necessarily the same as what the employee will think is a good alternative. So I think the best way of approaching alternative roles is as a conversation and as a suggestion rather than 
as um, something as that you as the employer think that the employee should do because there is a potential there for uh, disagreement um, between you and the employee that can be created by the perception that you're forcing them into uh, an alternative role. Um, think about reasonable adjustments, not just to the role. So we've talked a little bit about reasonable adjustments on the back of an occupational health report. Reasonable, as if the employee is disabled, there's a duty to make reasonable adjustments to the process if that disability places the employee at a specific substantial disadvantage. And so think about ways that you can adjust your absence management process to accommodate uh, the employee's disability. Things like giving extra warning of meetings, um, maybe holding the meetings virtually, maybe allowing the employee to be accompanied by someone to, uh, who isn't just a trade union representative or a work colleague, um, allowing them to put things in writing ahead of the meeting. All these kind of things can be put in place as ways to um, adjust the process to accommodate um, substantial disadvantage and, and get over the substantial disadvantage that can be caused by uh, the employee's disability uh, as part of the process. Uh, and finally, dismissal and appeal. Um, the key question, the key question that an employment tribunal will ask itself when deciding about the fairness of a dismissal of a, 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 an employee who's been absent for a long period of time is, would it have been reasonable for you as the employer to wait any longer to terminate that employee's employment? Would it have been reasonable for you to wait any longer to see what would have happened um, with that employee's illness um, before taking that decision to dismiss. And that, that, that's where we come back to the occupational health report and that's why that's key because if that report says, well, the employee might be well enough next week to return to work with a phased return and various reasonable adjustments, then it's unlikely to be fair to dismiss that employee. Whereas if that report says this employee is going to be uh, sick for at least the next six months and maybe not able to return to work even after that, and there isn't anything you can do to facilitate their return, then you're in a much better position to justify a dismissal um, because the answer to that question is um, more likely to be that it wouldn't be reasonable for you to carry on waiting any longer. But all these things around length of service and the impact on the business and alternative roles, they all feed into the decision about uh, whether or not the, the decision to dismiss in this situation is fair. And so it's very difficult to say um, how long an employee should wait because it is very fact specific depending on the specific employee and their, their circumstances. If you do take the decision to dismiss, then it's a, dis it's a dismissal with notice or pay in lieu of notice. And then there is an option uh, for the employee to appeal. And it's the usual kind of process where um, all the formal meetings and particularly the final meeting, you should give the employee the right to, to be accompanied by a trade union representative or work colleague. And you should tell the employee ahead of that final meeting that one possible outcome of the meeting could be the termination of their employment. And then you should offer them the right of appeal as well. Um, and, and the appeal should be to a more senior uh, and independent person who hasn't been involved in the process to date. So that is long-term uh, sickness absence. And now I'm going to move on to short-term sickness absence. Brilliant, thanks Tom. Um, so uh, short-term sickness absence, F for me, I think it, again, I'm gonna repeat myself, it's about addressing it quickly. It's about monitoring the situation. It's about finding out when the employees met those triggers, if you have triggers for short-term sickness absence in your business, and then um, getting to the nub of the problem quickly with them. Um, my suggestion would be to have uh, an initial meeting where you talk about the reasons for the absence in the same way as long-term ill health absence. 
um, and look at whether there is a pattern developing here. Is this a misconduct case where the employee is malingering and taking days off when they're not actually sick? Could that be something that would then lead to a conduct process rather than an absence management process? It's very difficult to prove, um, but that shouldn't stop you if, you're, if you've got a genuine um, concern that it might be uh, a misconduct issue from putting that to the employee and saying, look, this is what it looks like to me. What, what do you say? Uh, and depending on the employee's response, um, you, you could then move on to uh, a, a misconduct situation rather than a, uh, an incapability situation or, or an absence management situation. Um, so that, that would be something that I would look at at a very early stage and trying to determine which one of those things it is. <clears throat> you then move on to the, the normal um, warnings that uh, employers give to employees in terms of uh, first written warning, final written warning, dismissal and appeal and I think we'll all be very familiar with those type of uh, situations. Where you're giving a written warning it's important to recap the amount of absence, the number of occurrences and also set out what improvement you want to see from the employee in terms of their absence so that the employee understands what they've got to do to avoid getting a final written warning and eventually being dismissed. Um, <clears throat> the, the same um, underlying conditions need to be addressed as with long-term ill health absence in terms of potential disabilities um and problems with colleagues and workload and again this is something that you should you should be looking at an early stage when you're asking yourself was is this misconduct you should also be asking yourself is there anything we can do for this employee on the flip side of the coin um it, are they is the employee in a difficult situation at work that we don't know anything about encourage the employee to talk to you and see whether or not there is there is anything you can do to resolve that situation that's going to allow them to attend work on a more regular basis and also all the other things apply in terms of understanding whether or not the employee has got a disability and then making reasonable adjustments for that disability um, if necessary and the same process applies in terms of moving on to dismissal uh, and appeal. So I think that brings me to the end of my part of the talk. Uh, so I'm now going to move on uh, to uh, pass over to, to Toby to, to take you through the next, the next bit of the talk. Over to Toby. Lovely stuff. Thank you very much, Tom. Yep, if you can walk me over to the next slide, please. So um, my part of the talk today is going to be looking at the other reasons for absence um, that are related to COVID. So going to be looking at things like you know, ongoing childcare issues, local lockdowns and quarantines. So the first one I'm going to touch on today is the quarantine issue. Um, so if an employee shows to go abroad and now has to self-isolate when they come back. I have to say, I don't know about um, Lilo and, and Tom, I think this is the reason for absence that I've seen cause the most ill feeling between employers and employees. I think what, what it's viewed as is being a reason for being away from work that is entirely within that employee's control. So whilst a lot of this is going to be me um, being fairly harsh on what the rules should be, I'm not bashing people who go off on, on holiday. It just, it just sounds like I am. So if, if an employee, they come back from leave, um, they've gone to a place where they need to quarantine when they come back. Um, the first port of call is if they are able to and they are willing to work from home, then they should be able to work from home. We cannot, as an employer, require them to come into the workplace. If we do, we might get prosecuted or um, a fine of up to a thousand pounds. So that is that is if we require them to come into work during a period of quarantine. You know, obviously point there is you have to have knowledge. So if they've just slipped off to France 
um, or somewhere else um, and they've come back and we didn't know that that's where they'd gone. We asked them to come back into work, but they just come back into work. It's not our fault. But if we know when they come back, they should be quarantining, then we can't have them back in. We should be forcibly removing them from the workplace if they don't choose um, to leave themselves. Um, if they work from home, they're able to work from home as per the use, um, then they can get paid as normal. You know, um, if they cannot work from home and if they are required to quarantine, then there is no entitlement to statutory sick pay. So they don't fall into the exemptions under the rules. They are not deemed to be incapable from work. They are entitled to nil pounds, nil pence whilst they're away um, under a statute anyway, potentially not under their contract of employment, but I'll come on to that in a second. So um, if an employee is required to self-isolate because they are living with someone who has symptoms of coronavirus or they themselves have um, coronavirus, um, then they'll get SSP. Now, if they are, as I say, if they're coming back from quarantine as well, traveling, um, they don't qualify for it unless they are required to self-isolate for any other reason. So the latter part of that test, they do not need to self-isolate for any other reason. So obviously open them to some element of abuse. So if people didn't know when they were going away that when they came back, they had to quarantine. Equally, they didn't know when they come back from quarantine that they're not entitled to any pay you might find the employees develop a cough. They develop some other type of symptom that then might require them to self-isolate during that period of time, and therefore, shock horror, they are also entitled to pay. Now, that is, that, yeah, that, that is a bit critical of employees, but if it's a difference between not being paid and being paid, I know which one I would choose, especially because you can go on the app and just tap and say exactly what you've got, and no one checks up on it. Um, on, a less, on a less paranoid note, it obviously is open for employers to decide how they are going to pay those employees whilst they're on quarantine. So you need to check the contract first. If the contract says that we will pay you whilst you're incapable of coming to work, then it might well be that you're contractually obliged to pay those people anyway. Um, if it's not, just as you're deemed incapable of work or you're sick or whatever it might be in the terms of both that, um, that wording, and yeah, you know, they probably won't be a tight pay during that period of time. What we're always looking at here is applying a consistent approach across all of our employees. So say we've got two people, both go to France, both required to quarantine, we've got to treat them in the same way. But we as employers are obviously going to have to look at those shades of grey. So there are going to be differences between the different people who go to France at different times. So say someone goes away, the quarantine rules change whilst they're away. It's pretty harsh. For when they come back, they say, well, look, we're not, we're not going to pay you anything at all for that period of time. It would be fair under the legislation because they're still required to quarantine. But we as employers might exercise our discretion to say, well, look, we know that you got caught out whilst you were away. Maybe we can work something out with you for pay. Especially, we probably need to pay them if they come back from work from a business trip. Uh, one of my clients, they, um, yeah, a lot of international travel that's still going on because they do um, ongoing repairs to large pieces of machinery. Anyone goes away, if they're required to quarantine, they pay them full pay for when they return. Um, also, we can look at other reasons for paying people full pay, things like if they're traveling abroad for another, other reasons and holidays. You know, so say if they're attending a family funeral um, abroad as well, we might want to exercise our discretion to pay them for that period of time uh, whilst they're off. What, what's, what is um, key for us all here is to communicate those terms quite clearly when we're making our decision about what we're going to be doing for upcoming travel arrangements. We can call it a COVID travel policy, whatever it might be, but it's going to show people how we as an employer are going to interpret those rules. You know, there are always going to be shades of grey. I mean, that's a lovely, wonderful thing about employment law. Um, you know, you never quite set out things completely in stone. Things like, what if an employee says to you, uh, I need a foreign holiday because of mental health, because I've got an underlying mental health issue, and I need that time. You know, what do we do? We should, maybe we should accommodate it, discuss different type of travel destinations as well, allow that period of time, look at potential pay over it. You know, it is going to be a case of um, viewing each case on its substantive merits. And what I'd encourage everyone to do right now is when, when someone is putting a holiday request in, you need to be looking at um, a bit more detail from them. Nor would it just be, I want a holiday, it's over these days, employer goes, yeah, that's fine. Probably what we would need to do here is amendings and say, well, what, what are you doing? You know, is there going to be a foreign trip? Have you thought about what might happen if you do need to quarantine when you do return? You know, are we going to get people to book in? In essence, if they go away for a week, do we get them to book three weeks of leave instead? you know, have a three week period when they're coming back, if we know they are going to need to quarantine or have that as a potential that if the rules change whilst they're away, 
they are going to be required to take a further two weeks of holiday and they understand and they agree to that at the time when they're booking their leave. Um, it is difficult to impose sanctions on people for going away and then coming back and you know just getting caught by the quarantine rules. You know, potentially if we if we put in place a workplace policy that says don't travel to a destination that requires quarantine when you do return because we do still need you in work, disciplinary action might be appropriate. The problem that um, we're finding here is that that type of disciplinary action does not play very well with either the workforce or with um, the public as a whole. So what we're really doing to people is we're saying, well, you're following the coronavirus rules. Here's a disciplinary for that. And it, whilst that isn't the case, we're saying you contribute our workplace policy on traveling to a destination that didn't require quarantine. That's not as catchy a headline. So I think if you're a business that's, um, you know, well respected in your local area or it's one that you know um a lot of new places quite like having a little pop-up it might be worth taking that into account when considering what disciplinary measures you are going to take for something that arises out of this as well and, you know it is it is an approach it is an approach we do need to look at um it's just about being consistent i would say look at the rules have a policy in place that covers off what you are going to do when these matters do arise because they probably will arise um, and it's probably quite prevalent right now as well. I mean, especially in Derbyshire, um, where I am, they're, they're half terms next week. So, you know, a lot of people are going to be booking that time off as well. It would be worth inquiring those people what they are going to do. And it does lead me on quite nicely to my next slide, which is about childcare um, and local lockdowns as well. Because it could be that person comes back and then they're required to quarantine for a set period of time. They might be able to work from home. But if they've come back from half term, it might be that their children have come with them when they went on holiday. So the children are able to go into school. So here we have a separate section about yeah, childcare. So obviously in the early stages of the pandemic, all the schools were closed except for um, um, children of critical workers. Um, so that led to quite a lot of parents who um, were still working, balancing that childcare requirement with the ability to do work at that time. Um, you know, at that point, obviously, a lot of employers did take that into account. You know, everyone was flexible about it. They knew that people had childcare issues at that point in time. They were flexible and enabled them to maybe reduce their targets or work flexibly during the day um, to allow them to balance the need to do childcare with their obvious ongoing requirements for work. Um, schools at the moment, you know, they're endeavouring to stay open as far as they can. I mean, what we're seeing right now is that a lot of that is based on um, head teachers' views. And pay teachers views and how well they're going to keep those schools open and what their priorities are in keeping schools open, but also whether or not they're going to be um, isolating bubbles, um, individual classes, or potentially a, a whole school, um, depending on size and the level of the outbreak as well. So it's going to continue, um, you know, childcare responsibilities. They don't gel well um, with having to do work at the same time. Um, so again, what, we, what we're encouraging everyone to look at right now is you know, a school closure policy or um, a child isolation policy or a COVID childcare policy, you know, wh whatever, whatever we choose to call it, but identifies how we are going to deal with those instances where someone can't work because of childcare. I mean, this is what, it, like, like, kind of like Tom just said as well, you know, there is going to be a change in shift here. So don't about you, I mean, mo most employers would take on, say if someone had um, a, an ill child, you'd use a time off a dependence policy, you know, short term, go home, make sure your child's all right, and then come back to work, uh, probably either the next day or you're booking some leave to care for your child as well. You know, having this balance in terms of that child being forced to remain away from school or having to return from school on very short notice, you know, that for employers, it's actually quite key to have as, a, as a, an idea about how that is going to work, what you're going to expect of your employees. You know, when someone notifies us that they um, have childcare responsibility, what do we do? You know, do we look at agreeing with them when they're going to work? So, you know, you know can you put your child to, to bed and then work in the evening if that work is definitely needed to be doing? Can we agree with you a set period of time where you don't have to work and we'll make other arrangements for your work to be done, reducing targets? How we agree with them if, you know, if they're stuck at home, in essence, you know, they're all having to quarantine or, or to self-isolate. Um, the child might, might be well during that period of time. The child might be poorly during that period of time. How, how, do we, how do we balance those within our policy? And we can have those streams, you know, have those streams about what this is making we're going to take and what we're going to base that on and then how we agree that with people. I mean, I've already seen a couple of discrimination claims that have come out of, of childcare arising out of COVID. And one chap who said that he was furloughed because of his childcare issues and he wouldn't have been furloughed if he'd been a woman. Again, interesting, interesting argument. And I had a female member of staff as well, and she claimed 
that um, male workers were treated more sensitively when they made a request for flexibility for childcare. And her claim is that she believes that a, um, when a woman makes a request for childcare, it's viewed as a permanent issue. Whereas when a man makes a request for childcare flexibility, that was a, a short term or a temporary fix, more of a, you know, I'll allow my other members of my family to do this childcare and I'll only be doing it for a short period of time. Whereas she was saying for her, she treated more critically because it was, it was more of a, well, why haven't you sorted out your childcare? Again, very, very interesting, interesting arguments that are coming out of it. But it's definitely worthwhile considering that when you're applying your policy to. I mean, local lockdowns are going to get more prevalent as well. It's my next point here. Um, you know, it, it might well be that employees just simply aren't able to enter a workplace and that workplace has to be shut down because of a local lockdown. Um, but probably the worst outcome to it would be where you're able to still open. The government hasn't told you to close. Um, you're not forced to close completely, but what do you then do? Because there's a, a massively reduced demand um, for employees. You know, again, we look at reintroducing or introducing homeworking. If they're struggling to get into work, it might be that bus services around them are, are reduced. Or there might be ongoing local guidance about completely removing yourself from public transport as well. Um, you can use the furlough scheme up until the end of October. Um, but then after that point, if you can't work, or you can't offer people those hours of work, it's going to come to a head where employers then need to make a decision about what they're going to do. You know, it can be that if we know that it's going to be for a short period of time, that's a, a significant restriction for a shorter period whilst we make some steps, we could agree annual leave. You know, agree an annual leave circuit breaker with all our employees, staying over a set period of time, and having it mixed in with, with full pay and um, other, other elements of pay as well. Um, or, you know, potentially looking at unpaid leave or layoff. Um, for either an ongoing or a short period of time as well before we consider redundancies. You know, the best circumstances to take in a local lockdown is not to react too quickly, but also not to take too long in sort of coming to a decision on it. It is just looking for that Goldilocks zone uh, and what steps you're going to take. Um, but there are always those ongoing options to it. You know, how well can we have our employees work from home? Can we put them back onto furlough? What do we do with annual leave? Can we do um, unpaid leave as well? Can we look at um, layoff? And try and get everyone in on making those decisions together to keep that business open and running so that core, core kind of transparency and openness is key and very lastly for me i'm going to look um, at um, some health and safety obligations in the workplace as well so it's just on to the next slide um yeah employers remain under a duty to protect the health and safety of their employees any affected employee is going to need to remain away from work whilst their risk is assessed as well this can be if they are notified that they have been in contact with someone who might have um, coronavirus. I had one of these the other day, and it, it, again, it's, it's a difficult balance to draw. So the chap who he was with somebody who's playing football with them, and they believed that they had uh, coronavirus, and they were in the process of getting a test. He had not been contacted by Track and Trace, had no symptoms, and did not know whether or not his friend actually did have coronavirus he drove to work sat in his car and called us and said and called my client sorry called my client and said um this is what's taken place and my client's view was well you're not deemed incapable for work because you're not under the ssp regulations you're not required to remain away from work but you're a risk to us because until we know whether or not that other individual has got coronavirus or not, we don't know whether or not you should be self-isolating or not. So he got sent home. Now he didn't have an entitlement to pay at that point either. So he, being a good citizen, told us what was going on, gave us a full indication of it, and we then stopped his pay. And again, we're doing it on the basis of protecting our workforce, and that was probably quite appropriate at the time. It just, it just doesn't play very well when you're talking with your employees about it. So again, they have quite a large workforce and um, they've got quite a big call center. Um, what they couldn't do was start making exceptions for those people. You know, someone calls in and they say, I'm, I'm, I'm unable to work because of this. I might have been in contact. I just simply don't know. They'd hemorrhage money at a time when they really need that, um, that cash flow coming in. So they had to take that quite difficult decision and explain it to that employee in quite a lot of detail, but thank them obviously for their, for that honesty with it. Um, that's just inherently tricky. It's inherently tricky. You know, if someone's got uh, unwell with COVID symptoms, get straightforward, stay at home, follow the stay at home guidance as well. 
um, if we're finding that there's more than one case of coronavirus um, associated with a workplace, um, we are required as an employer to contact our local health protection team to report a suspected outbreak as well. So if you know, someone comes into the workplace with coronavirus, the current official guidance from AKS and the government is that that workplace does not need to close. However, we need to be alive to the fact that we could be involved in a, a potential outbreak and notify employees who are there. Um, and we might have to have um, a lot of our staff um, self-isolate in line with the contact tracing obligations as well. We may need to look at closing our workplace in such situations, even doing it for 72 hours, doing a deep clean, inviting everyone back, doing it in stages, putting further stringent measures in place. It's all part of um, our being COVID secure. It's all part of following the government guidelines and having that contingency plan in place as well. You know, what would happen if this took place? It's great to have it written down. If you have it written down and it all does happen, then you know exactly what to do. You know who's got responsibility for what. So that's the end of my part of the talk. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much all um, for attending today as well. We've got a few questions in the Q&A as well. If you want to pop any more questions as we go through, please just type those down and we'll have to come back to them. Great, thank, thanks, for thanks for that, Toby. That's, uh, that's really helpful. Um, Tom, can you just roll on to the next slide, please? So there you go. Um, there are beautiful faces for you to look at while we're uh, answering these questions. Um, so the first one uh, is from Nicola. We have a member of staff who has said that they need to self-isolate for four weeks because their partner is having IVF. Normally, we would allow paid leave for up to three days of treatment. Are we unreasonable if we say they can have paid leave to a company hospital only, but the rest unpaid. Toby, do you want to deal with that one? Ah, that's a good one. It's a good one to, to drop on me. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> that's super interesting. I mean, I, I'd say on that one, if they are if they are being if they're being required to self isolate because a hospital has told them that they have to then they're being required by a doctor to, to self-isolate. So, I mean, I think they probably fall into the deemed, um, deemed and capability provisions in the SSP. Um, but equally, <laughs> if, you, if someone else got told to self-isolate by a doctor and they get SSP or a discretion to pay, and then you decide to not allow a person who was going off for IVF treatment to have full pay, that's potentially unfavorable treatment on the grounds of pregnancy. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I would say have a chat with them about it. Definitely get those letters from that doctor to see exactly what they say. Some people say that they believe that they need to self-isolate and that letter might not address them at all. It might not even address their entire household. And I've not obviously come across something like this saying that it's four weeks before for a partner. Um, yeah, for a partner to self-isolate because another person is going through IVF. Um, definitely worth having a full chat with them about it as well and agreeing some sort of structuring with them or you know if they can work from home then then grand you know that would obviously probably um, obviate quite a lot of those issues there. Great thanks for that Toby. Uh, Andrea asks if someone is absent due to morning sickness how should this be treated in terms of number of days and occurrences of absence, e.g. towards the Bradford factor score. Um, so I think this probably pulls into my part of the talk. Um, you've got to be careful here. We talked a lot, didn't we, about disability related absence. Um, but if this is pregnancy related absence, then there is also the possibility that the employee could bring a pregnancy and maternity uh, discrimination claim. So what we have to make sure is that we're not treating this, pe this person unfavorably as a result of their pregnancy. So that would mean discounting any pregnancy related absence uh, from your, your monitoring system. So just in the same way that you would um, discount any disability related absence, you would also discount any pregnancy related absence. Um, it's not um, the case that 
you can't dismiss a disabled employee because of absence, but you just have to make sure um, that um, it's, a re it's a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim. It's very unlikely uh, that it's going to be a proportionate, it's going to be um, fair to dismiss an employee for um, absence relating to pregnancy because by definition it's going to be uh, a short-term thing. So my suggestion would be to discount the pregnancy related absence and uh, just proceed on the basis of the, the, the normal uh, Bradford factor score. Um, there was just a couple of questions at the top of the page as well. I don't know if you saw them. Okay. Okay, yes, fine. Sorry. Yeah, so, so Nicola, uh, another question uh, from her. We have had a case of four employees going out socially at the weekend. However, one tested positive for COVID. Therefore, the other three are now self-isolating, which has hit our staffing levels. Is it reasonable for us to set rules for staff about this? We are a school. Um, Toby, do you want to do you want to take that one? It was probably your part of the talk, or you you can yeah. do it, Lil, if you want. Yeah, I mean, I can I can figure it out. I mean, so so I mean, if they're if they're following government guidelines, so if four four, I guess four employees, I imagine that's four households. If they're meeting up and they're socially distancing and they're following all of the guidelines, I can't I, I can't see that we can invade on that. You know, if someone's tested positive for COVID, that's just that's just how it goes. It impacts on our staffing level. Um, if the implication here is that they weren't following government guidelines, then yeah, you know, there's a potential um, issue for us there if that then has a knock-on impact to it, because it'd be the same as putting yourself out of work by doing something that was, you know, uh, maybe um, being inebriated um, and then not being able to attend their work appropriately the next day. <laughs> Um, I think it would be probably more appropriate for us to give guidance on what we expect our employees to do and also an indication to them that obviously if they are self-isolating, that is going to cause a knock and an impact to work. But I think just, just meeting up, if that's not in breach of local local legislation, um, local guidelines, then I don't think that's something that we can legislate for unless we are telling people that this could have an impact on us and then directing them about what to take in that, uh, do in that circumstance. Yeah, I, I think I'd agree with that. I, we can't go interfering in people's personal lives as long as they're following the rules. Um, but that doesn't stop you um, reminding them what the rules are and reminding them of what the possible impact on the school might be for having multiple <coughs> absences as a result of a positive test. Uh, Donna asks, SSP payment. Whilst SSP is payable for from day one, payroll have told us that this is only payable if the employee is away for four days or more. We have had employees who have been absent for two or three days waiting for their own test, and that is their negative, so have come back to work. What do we pay then? Lil, do you want to go take that one? I'm, I'm actually going to check with both you and Tom um, and Toby here, because I thought the waiting days had been waived. So my understanding <coughs> is that they are entitled to SSP from day one, irrespective of their length of absence. Um, and that was part of the point of changing the provisions to make sure that um, people are staying at home from the first day and receiving SSP for that. But Tom, Toby, correct me if I'm wrong on that, but that was certainly my understanding of the regulations. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, that person waiting for a test is deemed incapable. Exactly. So there's no, no waiting days. Exactly. So I think you'll I'd check that with your payroll provider because I think they might have got that wrong. Yeah, so the, the answer to the question, Donna, is we think that they're, that they're entitled to SSP from day one. Hmm. Great. I think that brings us to the end of the questions. Um, thank you for attending the webinar. Um, We've got another one coming up in November. Do we have a date for this yet, Lil? Yeah, I think it's um, the third Tuesday in November. I'm just checking my diary to see what that is, actually. That, um, is that the 17th? It is, yeah, 17th of November. <coughs> and currently we're um, planning on doing it on whistleblowing. So we've just seen an increase in 
queries and potential cases in relation to whistleblowing over recent months. Occasionally COVID related, but we'll try not to spend the whole session talking about COVID. But obviously, particularly um, for health and safety queries where employees are, I've got a case at the moment where someone who um, said he raised health and safety queries in the workplace, COVID related, um, and then was dismissed off the back of that. Um, but obviously, you know, there's just a general, we'll, we'll talk you through in general in terms of the provisions and the protections in place in relation to employees who blow the whistle and how to deal with it in practice if it does happen um, for your the organisation. So that's the current plan. Um, obviously, invites will go out um, a couple of weeks in advance and we'll let you know if anything changes. If there's any massive you know, change in, in the news um, in the interim, then we might look to concentrate on that instead. But currently, we're, we're planning on talking about whistleblowing during that session. Great. Yeah. And, and just finally, there, there should be a feedback form coming round and uh, we all uh, appreciate and welcome your feedback in terms, particularly in terms of the topics that we cover, we wanna make sure that these sessions are, uh, that they stay fresh and, and topical for all of you. So um, please do complete and return your feedback forms to us. Fantastic, I'm gonna say goodbye and let you get on with the rest of your day. Thank you for attending the webinar and we'll see you again next month. Thank you. Bye-bye.